the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Our last study assembled some of the components in understanding this prophecy, beginning with what appears some confusion in the translations in respect to the Hebrew word translated within the phrase, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood, whereas the meaning is clearly that the sword of the Lord is fulfilled with blood. The sword of the Lord is Jesus Christ as the eternal word of God, whose descent upon Idumea is a symbolic representation of his incarnation in human flesh, to fulfill the role of being a sacrifice for sin. The fulfillment of Christ's incarnation was his blood sacrifice. And this was the purpose of his coming. And therefore, when he went to the cross, the Lord said, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And we studied how the efficacy and power of Christ's testimony is based upon its culmination in the blood witness. It is made fat with fatness. As the power of truth is enriched by heaven through faithfulness in the testimony of Jesus Christ, as those who serve Christ also thereafter follow him in the laying down of their lives just as he also did. And this is the meaning of the prophecy, that the sword in heaven, which is the witness and power of God's word, is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats. And so at the same time, Jesus went to the cross, he made this statement also. He said, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And so we continue our study in this sixth verse of Isaiah 34. And inserted within this prophecy is the statement that the Lord's sword shall be fattened, as in enriched and made more effectual, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. In this Hebrew word translated rams is agil, which is the near universal word for ram in the King James Version, one of its earliest occurrences being Genesis 22:13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And so in this case, the ram signifies the substitutionary atonement offered by Jesus Christ. And other occurrences of this word are as follows. In a few instances, the word is used as a metaphor for mighty men. And this seems critical to understanding the sacrifice of a ram. A ram was symbolic of might, which was a chief attribute of Jesus Christ. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And this would appear critical to an understanding of this sacrifice of a ram. A ram was symbolic of might, a chief attribute of Jesus Christ. And in the truest sense of the principle, might belongs to Jesus Christ, who was even given all power in heaven and in earth. But even though his power was concealed while he walked the earth, well, he was mighty no less. And so we have the prophecy. I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. And this prophecy goes on to foretell that the enemies of Christ shall be beaten down before his face, and God's mercy shall be with him, speaking even of a horn that shall constitute the power of God. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Jesus Christ is that one who, in truth, is mighty before God. And yet the mighty was made weak for our sakes. Paul writes, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, 
but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. In Christ, the power of God, symbolized by a ram, was laid upon the altar of burnt offering. With the fat of kidneys of rams. The word translated kidneys is kilia, which means just that. It is first used in connection with the Mosaic sacrifices. In fact, this word is repeatedly used in the Levitical rites of animal sacrifice as an allusion to how the two kidneys were to be treated when making the sacrifice. However, when the word is used outside of the context of animal sacrifice, it is given a quite different translation. And this is because in English, the kidneys are rarely, if ever, used in any figurative or symbolic sense. In English, we might say someone has a good heart. But in the Hebrew, the kidneys are used in respect to the emotions, or to internal strength of action, in just the same way, beginning in the book of Job. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. And this is the same Hebrew word, kidneys, that Job uses in the context of the fear of judgment. In fact, medical science even informs us that fear and the fight or flight response has a source in the adrenal glands of the kidneys. And so there may be a little irony that scripture associates the kidneys with that part of our constitution subject to emotional unnerving. And so upon leaving its literal references in the Levitical law and proceeding into the prophets, or rather than translating this word kidneys, the word is then translated reins as a reference to our innermost being or strength of action. And this is the word used in the well-known prophecy of Jeremiah. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Christ, who died for the sins of humanity, has purchased every part of humanity in which could reside anything in which sin could be hidden. And what Christ, as the word of God, has purchased he shall have full examination concerning. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins. And so, when considering the Lord's words to the angel of the church of Thyatira, will we understand that his judgments invoke a fiery examination of our innermost being. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give every one of you according to your works. And so then, what are these reins that are symbolized by the law as kidneys? Well, this is laid out for us quite clearly by the writer to the Hebrews, where we read, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so the law of sacrifice appears to invoke allusion to the fiery examination of the inner thoughts and intents of the heart, as what was to be done with the kidneys? Well, they were to be taken aside and burned. And thou shalt take all the fat that covers the inwards, and the call that is above the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, and burn them upon the altar. While that verse certainly relates to the ceremonial ordinances of the law, we should not fail to see what, it, what is its true and more profound meaning, which is that those coming to Christ are due for an intense, invasive examination by God in respect to their innermost thoughts and intents of the heart. Those who receive Christ's atonement will undergo the divine scrutiny of his or her inner being. And if we truly desire holiness, then we must not run and hide from God's processes upon the soul. If we trust God, we will allow our innermost thoughts to be forfeit unto Christ. 
so that the mercies of God may purge and cleanse away all defilements. No wonder, therefore, that David, in using the very same Hebrew word, prays, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. David's desire was for holiness, and we cannot know holiness without knowing God's examination and his judgment. And the prophet Job stands in a, as an example of one who underwent God's invasive work of judgment. And of this experience, he states concerning its terrors, His archers compass me about, he cleaveth my reins asunder, and doth not spare, he poureth out my gall upon the ground. So the knowledge of the holy comes with a price, and this price involves the undoing of the natural man a process signified in the law of sacrifice as the removal of the kidneys for burning.